Well, good morning. Uh, it's a blessing to be able to uh, spend some time now the, this morning with you. Uh, I have to kind of get straight in my head what time it is. Uh, it's actually late afternoon for me, and uh, but uh, I know you'll be viewing this on Sunday morning for Sunday school. Um, I want to finish up from where we were at last week uh, on the family uh, dealing with the church. Uh, we've dealt with the church as an organism, and uh, we've dealt with the church as an agency. Uh, we've looked at the church uh, through several different adjectives uh, seen throughout the Bible. This last week, we were dealing with the church as a family, and uh, <clears throat> I had two points I did not get to finish, and I want to get in today. I want to start dealing with the church as a bride. Uh, remember what we're doing here. We're, we're establishing sound doctrine. Uh, these are uh, based upon our statement of faith. Uh, this is the doctrine which we believe. Uh, I believe that Christ died for the church. Uh, we've already established in our study. Uh, we've been on a church for some time that the church uh, is what Christ died for. And we go to the Pauline epistles. Oftentimes we make personal reference, but it was oftentimes speaking to a congregation of believers, uh, whether it was a Colossae or Philippi, uh, that the, the, those at Galatia, uh, those are the ones being talked to, the church at Thessalonica. And so uh, uh, the church at Jerusalem oftentimes is one that's being referenced. So uh, we need to remember that Christ died for the church and that the church uh, is the ones that have accepted God uh, without seeing him, without ever touching him or feeling him. And God says in Revelation chapter 1 that we're blessed people uh, simply because of that fact. So uh, I want to finish up on the home. Uh, I covered quite a bit of ground. Uh, we went back through it, how that uh, the family has a family name, a family father. We dealt with the family relationship, the family compassion. And uh, I got two points here right at the end, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, but I'd like to spend a little bit of time. I hope you all have had a, a very good weekend as far as uh, having family with you. I pray that you're all safe and well. And uh, I'm, I'm not relishing being online for a long period of time, but I do believe, in fact, I'm more settled in my heart now than I was before that this was the right move for us at this time. Uh, there is so many, so many sick. And it's, it's not just to those uh, who are elderly or have pre-existing conditions. We're seeing uh, some folks that are, have been very healthy and uh, and they now are dealing with the virus and and, uh, and their brothers and sisters in Christ and they're, they're, they're in tough shape. And so uh, we're not taking our time to pray this morning. I, I would be remiss. I know I'd miss people, but I pray that you're praying for those that's on our prayer wall and you'll go back to it and spend time with it and on it. Uh, by God's grace, I'm, I pray that I am preaching today at, uh, at the preaching hour live there at Lighthouse. And, and so uh, uh, I'm looking forward to me and Luke going in and being able to run the service from there. Uh, I think it'll be more productive. But I think I'm going to do my Sunday school lessons either from here at home or, or from the church over the next several weeks. And uh, I've tried doing several in one day, and it's I, I don't think it's as productive. So I'm trying to... I take a little bit of time throughout the week to be able to uh, invest myself. So I've run everybody out of the house today, and uh, uh, they're they're in different places. I've locked the door so I can spend a little time with you this morning. And uh, in John chapter 14 and verse 1 and 2, this is a very, very pa a familiar passage of Scripture. I want to deal with just a minute about our heavenly home. Uh, I thought it would be a good place to go. We're going to be dealing with the bride in just a little bit, and uh I guess it's probably one passage I almost always quote or read at a funeral. It's our hope. It's that heavenly hope that we have. Now let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. I like that. I like the fact that when I think of Jesus Christ, I know that I'm talking about God and to God. And he and the Father are one. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. 
uh, I like the idea of when I think about a home, uh, we think about the structure. Now, whether I live in an Arab country or or uh, I, I'm, I'm there in Jerusalem or I'm here in the United States, I'm still dealing with the same things you should find in every house. You find a door. Uh, you find windows. Uh, you find uh, the warmth and the caring in that house, that place of security. Uh, we've talked about it several times. I like the idea of the armed forces being around the king, the king in the center, and the, when, the, when the flag is up, that's where the king uh, is at, and we know that he's present, and we've already talked about that. So when I think about uh, my heavenly home, uh, it goes beyond uh, the pearly gates and the pearly white, but it does deal with the purity of it. It deals with the sanctity of it. Uh, it deals with uh, the value of it. When we think of streets of gold, we put value in that. Uh, I mean, that listen, gold gold is not even another mineral, an element to God. But the reality of it is God wants us to realize that there's value put on it. Uh, when we think of the pearly white, we want to think of the purity of it. Uh, we want to think of the sanctity of it. We, we want the, the, our children to think of, of of the place where they're uh, comfortable. As a child of God, I want to know that it's going to be a place that's familiar to me. And I look forward to being there. Um, it's the place where there's life. When I think of uh, my children growing up in our home uh, there in, in Baltimore, I, I think of all the, the noise and the clamor of the kids and uh, their discussions, their talks, their crying out for mom, uh, whatever it is, uh, their friends there coming in the front door, going out the back door. Uh, it's a place of life. When I get to heaven, I know it's a place of life. No more death. That's the home. I'm going to be home. Uh, I, I don't mind traveling. I've done a lot of it over the last 20 years. and and uh, But there's just something about getting home. That last few few miles you're anticipating, you looking forward to uh, the familiar smells, uh, the looks. You know what I'm talking about. God wants us to be able to embrace that as Christians. He wants us to look forward to that. I, I, I like the idea. I hate moving. I hate to move. I've done more than my share fair, fair share of moving around. I don't like changing houses. And uh, I like the idea that once I move into my mansion, into my heavenly home, I'll never move out. I will never move out. I am there for good. It is mine for eternity. Nobody can evict me. Nobody can kick me out. Listen, it's a place I want to be, and I want to be there every moment of eternity. Maybe we ought to re-examine the new Jerusalem and the heavenly home and look at it from the perspective of the way God wants us to see it. There's no way that we can picture it. There's no way that we can actually know what it's going to be like, but God has given us that picture of a home, and we know what that is. I sad to say that many that have grown up have grown up in homes that was nothing like what we may experience in heaven, and that's the work and the doing of the devil, and I hate it. But we have a heavenly home that we look forward to. We have a, a a family inheritance. The last point I had was dealt with the inheritance. Um, Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son than an heir of God through Christ. Hebrews eleven seven by faith Noah, being warned of God, <clears throat> excuse me, of things not seen, as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Romans eight seventeen. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Um, no more servant, but an heir. 
I love the story of Mephibosheth. I love the, the story of, of David seeking him out and, uh, and finding that crippled, dirty little boy and putting him at the king's table and daring anyone to say anything to him. Uh, I love the idea that God has an inheritance for me. I didn't do anything for it. I don't deserve it. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not even a good caretaker for it. Nothing in my character puts me in a position where I'm what I should be with my inheritance, my heirship, but I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for the fact that I'm saved and I'm born again and I have a home in heaven and it's a, it's a family inheritance. It comes directly from the Father. I like the idea that, that listen, the, the will that God established through the truth of his word of God, uh, that it'll never go to probate court. No, I, nobody's going to question it. They're not going to question the validity of it, the validity of it or the authority of it. Uh, this home is mine. This inheritance is mine. I thank God today for my heavenly home. I thank God today for the organism of the local church. I thank God today that what we have as a church family is what we're going to have in heaven. Uh, we have right now the, organ, the organism, the opportunity to see how, how heaven is going to be established in perfection. Imagine, imagine all of us being saved that's in the local church and all of us living in the spirit all the time. Now eliminate all of the uh, temptations of the flesh or the strength of the flesh or the doubts of the conscience. And we begin to get a glimpse of the security and the love that we're going to find in our heavenly home. I can't wait. I get excited. I get thrilled over the very thought of it. Take your Bibles with me, if you would, this morning and go to the book of Revelation. I love the book of Revelation. It's not a book that I, I preach a lot out of. I really enjoyed when Brother Martin, several years ago, went through the book of Revelation. And I got to hear part of those messages, and I really did enjoy them. Uh, it's not one that I often preach in. I'm more of a practical preacher. Uh, I think sometimes people get hung up on prophecy, and the reality is I, I love prophecy. I love looking forward to what God's going to do, but God wants me to live right now, and he wants me to live under the structure of the Word of God, believe the Word of God, and oftentimes I think people get into prophecy and they don't serve. And what good is it knowing what God's going to do if you're not involved in what God's doing right now? So that's, I have a tendency to shy away from it sometimes. But I want to go to Revelation chapter 19 and drop down to verse, uh, this is really dealing with one through eight, but let's look at verse seven. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. That's great. That deals with the bride of Christ. That's us. That's who? That's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's those that are saved and born again, been baptized into the local assembly, served in the local assembly. And uh, you believe that, that people in other denominations, I don't really care for the word denomination. I do believe that there's there's going to be people that are not independent Bible-believing Baptists it's in heaven. I believe that there's, there's going to be some good stout Presbyterians and Methodists, and uh, they can call themselves whatever they want to call. I believe the Baptist is a, Baptist, is a Bible name, and that's why I'm Baptist. I believe it's closest to the doctrine that we find in Scripture. I think we're the ones that go right back to that church at Jerusalem, and I believe that we've been blood washed. There's a line of the blood washed all the way from that point all the way forward to now. And uh, so that is our belief. That's where we lead. But I, I do believe that all of us that are saved and born again are going to be in heaven. Now, I do have some differences as far as who's going to be married at that marriage feast. And I think that has to do with our service and our accountability and our fruit. And uh, that's for another time. And that does deal with prophecy. But I would like to deal with the church is the bride today. And the Bible says right there that we should be glad, we should rejoice, 
and we should give honor to him. Uh, for the marriage of the lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. <laughs> wow. I'd love to be able to spend a lot of time on that. I'm not going to be able to because I do want to move on. I've got uh, a couple more areas I want to deal with the church, and then we're going to move into some more doctrine as quickly as we can. I have another direction I want to go in Sunday school, but I really feel like I needed to do this, and I need to go back through, and I want to be able to put it out in uh, in a paper form or at least have it online available to where folks can take the time, if they want to, to know what they believe and be able to seek it out, and, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this. We looked at our church covenant, and we've also now dealing with the statement of faith and what our doctrine is. So we've dealt with the church as a body, as an organism, an agency, a house, and a family. Now we're going to deal with the church as the bride. And uh, I think all of us can see the analogy and uh, that we find in scriptures. And uh, I want to uh, remind you that anytime we're dealing, especially when we're dealing with bride here, that there's always those comparisons between the first Adam, second Adam. Now, you that may not have been saved a long time or taken the time to study, but uh, you understand that the second Adam is the Lord Jesus Christ. The first Adam failed because he fell in sin. And Adam, because of that, uh, sin was uh, not only on him, but in him. And he passed that on to the generations to come. If the second Adam, that second Adam was sinless, it was the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to make a few comparisons uh, between Genesis 1 and 2 and and uh, the first Adam and the second Adam that we find over there in Matthew chapter 27. And uh, so I'm going to, I, I hope I can spend some time doing that. I'm going to try to keep track of my time this morning and not spend too much time and uh, waste your time. Uh, I don't think we ever waste our time reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, but I do want to be conscious of time this morning. I want you to be able to prepare yourself to be able to, uh, to listen to the message at the 11 o'clock hour. Adam's wife was purposed by God before creation from the uh, society of Adam. We know that God took the rib of Adam and made Eve. Uh, there's no doubt about it. He said, I will make thee a helpmeet. So likewise, Christ's bride, now that's dealing with the local church, was purposed by God uh, before the very, the very foundation of the world, to be honest with you. But uh, uh, as far as the church is concerned, and before creation, uh, this foundation was set in the world that the church would be the helpmate of the Savior. So just like Eve was the helpmate uh, for Adam, uh, the church is the helpmate for the second Adam, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, define that, preacher. Well, uh, if you know what a helpmate is, all you have to do is look at a wife. Uh, if we look scripturally at the responsibilities of a wife, she supports the, the husband. Uh, she emphasizes what the husband is teaching in the home. Uh, uh, she reiterates what the husband has said. Uh, she's the mouthpiece oftentimes of the husband. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, we know, is on the right hand of the Father. And because he's on the right hand of the Father, even now, and he's working in us through the working of the Holy Spirit, uh, we as Christians are the helpmeet of the Savior. Uh, that's where we need to see ourselves. So when we think of bride, uh, we know that we're going to uh, one day uh, be complete, adorned. That's what the Bible says, we're adorned before all of heaven. The Old Testament saints could be present. And uh, uh, we know that the angels are going to be present. We're going to have God the Father, God the Son, the Spirit of God all present. But listen, we've been decked out for him. And God calls us blessed. And we're the ones that are his helpmate. And so uh, I praise the Lord that uh, uh, we are put in that position. And we ought to see ourselves that way. Each and every one of us ought to see ourselves that way. Uh, our church ought to be looked on that way. We ought to think of ourselves as the mouthpiece for the Father, the, the one that reemphasizes what he says. What he did, what he said in the Word of God is what we give to others. I don't give any more, any less. Uh, I want all, the, all of the creation of God to understand the position that I'm from, that I'm a child of God. And I'm part of the local church, is, and so therefore I'm a part of the bride of God. And uh, not because I deserve it. Because any beauty that the, the church has today, it received because of God. It's not of any righteousness that we have. So uh, Adam's bride lived because his side 
was wounded in his sleep. Uh, I'm sure that you're aware that that uh, uh, God the Father put a sleep over Adam. And when he put him to sleep, then he removed that rib from him. So he, he did surgery on Adam. Now, honestly, whether he reached in there and took that rib out and it just healed itself over, I have no idea. But I do know that he took the rib from Adam to make Eve. That's what he did. And uh, so he was wounded and he said, Christ's bride lives because his side, the second Adam's, was wounded in death. Uh, it's very important for us to remember that. You know, um, Eve was from Adam. And we are from Christ. Uh, our podcast on Monday nights, we're right now dealing with uh, who we are in Christ. You do understand that the the local church would not be the church. We would not have rights to heaven. Uh, we would not have our eternal hope if it was not for the wounding of the Lord Jesus Christ or his sacrifice for him dying for us. Uh, I think it's good that we can realize and see that everything that the first Adam didn't accomplish, that the second Adam did. And the, the, the goal that God has in the New Testament is that all the world have the capability or opportunity to become part of the bride. Uh, man rejects the Lord Jesus Christ as his choice. But, it's, but he has to step over the blood of Jesus to do it. Uh, Adam's bride lived because his side was wounded in sleep. Christ's bride lives because his side, the second Adam's, was wounded in death. Adam's bride was part of his own body. The bride of Christ, likewise, was part of his own body and is said to be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. The church lives because his, Jesus, side was wounded. Uh, I, I, I hope that you, uh, I hope that you respond the way that often the word of God puts me in a position to respond, and that's with humility. Uh, I've been around those that have sacrificed greatly for the cause of Christ. I've been around missionaries that I was so humbled by their experiences on the field that I feel like that anything that I've done has been so minimal in serving the Lord. I've seen men and women that uh, were so dedicated to the cause of Christ, so honored for the position of servant that, uh, I didn't feel like that I deserved to be in their shadow. John chapter 20, verse 27, it says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, reach hither thy hand, and thrust it in my side, and be not faithless, but believing. I am because of him. Very simply. My, my faith or my trust or my belief in God is in the wounded Christ. And he who bears the wounds, he's wounded right now. I mean, he's, listen, he's in heaven on the right hand of the Father. But when we're all settled and all's done, the marriage feast is over. When the, when the devil's been cast into the bottomless pit, when eternity now is all that's before us, you do understand that Jesus will bear those wounds throughout the eternity. A reminder constantly before all of us that we are his bride, but he's the one that paid the price that we might be so. I love the fact that in John chapter 19, verse 34, it says, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. The broken heart of Jesus Christ burst forth onto the side of the body, down his legs, down the cross, and into the ground. My God, my Savior, 
the bridegroom of the church, took that blood before the Father in heaven, applied that to the mercy seat, that I might stand before my Savior clothed in white, adorned, not because of anything I've done, but what he's done for me. <sighs> Didn't hurt us to pause, does it? Give some thought to reflect daily on what Jesus has done for us. I know a lot of preachers are just like myself. I I don't think I would have ever been where I'm at today if it was not for the God who saved me and a woman who reminded me of it. But I do know that we're 47 years into marriage now that, that we are what we are together, not because of the vacations we ever went on, but it was the valleys we went through together. the loss, the sharing of loss, us watching and realizing our faith together, watching God answer prayers, witness, being witness to God's miracle of life around us in the new birth and birth, all sharing that together. I love the fact that God says, Howard, you have no cause to be faithless. You should be believing. You should be reminded in your own heart and conscience through my spirit daily for what I've done for you. Adam's bride was formed by God himself from the side of the first man. The bride of, G of Christ is being formed likewise by God himself in person in a ministry of the blessed Holy Spirit. I hope you picked it up. Adam's bride was formed by God himself. God took a rib and made Eve. The church, just like that rib was taken and formed, God took himself and then formed us from himself. See, the attributes of the church are the attributes of Jesus Christ. Uh, everything that he did from the first step that he took in his earthly ministry till the moment that he ascended into heaven, everything was an example. Every action was an example of what we could and should be. How long would it take me to preach that? How long would it take me to take the time to go through everything that Jesus has taught us by example when he was on the earth. I guarantee you, I promise you, that every bit of it would be relative and that which we could compare the flesh and the spirit with. When he says he prepared his bride, when he tells us there that he's made her ready, he's made her ready. He's done that for me, he's done that for you. Adam's bride was created to be his helpmate. The bride of Christ is created to be his helpmate. We are workers together in the vineyard of, of souls. We enjoy the fellowship of his suffering, being made partakers with our Lord. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, it says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. <clears throat> it's all his doing. Only God could look at us and see us in his own purity. 
Only God could look at us and love us. The day I got married, I felt so very fortunate. I had no idea how fortunate I was. I had no idea of what God had done for me the day I married my wife. I cannot, I cannot wait to experience what it's like to have Jesus look at us and with his compassion and his love, his sacrifice and his righteousness, we be presentable to the Father as his bride. I think it pulls it all together. You think, well, preacher, are we doing everything we should be doing? Absolutely not. Don't think we ever will. But I know that I want to please him. I know that as a Christian, I want to, I want to be obedient to him. I want to, I want to fulfill the position and not only of, as a family member, but as the bride that he looks upon with that love and compassion as Song of Solomon talks about. I love reading that book, and I can read it over and over and over. I don't know if any of you do it, and I'll, cl I'll close with this. I don't know if any of you do it, but if you were like I was, I'd, I can remember writing some letters and cards to Debbie before we got married. And uh, I can remember at certain points in my life, we'd look at these cards. And I can remember back then being a little embarrassed by the type of things that I said. I don't feel that way at all anymore. I think it was just me getting a glimpse at how fortunate I thought I was, how much I thought I cared for, and now I realize that through the Lord Jesus Christ and a life of surrender and sacrifice and obedience and sharing that uh, some of those juvenile things that I said was but the tip of the iceberg of what I really would one day experience in emotion, in feelings, in truth. So I take that then and I say, Okay, then, in my juvenile thoughts, in my childlike way to express the way I think and see God, imagine what it's going to be like when we get there. I can say I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that we have to meet the way we're meeting right now. I don't like it. I'm so sorry for the hour and day that we live in. When I look at my grandchildren, my great, and one day my great grandchildren, Lord willing, and my own children, and I, and I have to shore up my faith because I'm concerned about them. But I do know that the conclusion of all of this is going to be standing before Him at the marriage supper of the Lamb and. And to hear his words and to see his looks. Been real sentimental lately. Uh, I've God's been working on me. I've been very thankful. Been thankful for my family, for health, for our church, our church family. God is so faithful, and I love watching God do His work. And I want to be able to put my trust and faith in him. And I hope that through, even in Sunday school, us looking at the church, that all these adjectives, all these descriptive words that God uses to describe, to describe what it, the church is, will help you to realize that all God is after is not about us going out here and winning the world even. It's all about our personal relationship with him. He just wants us to do it because we love him. That's it. It's that simple. But unless you know him, unless you're experiencing that, unless you're having that kind of relationship through prayer and reading your Bible, I can't instill that in you. 
We suffer together. We have hardships together. Pray for one another. Lift one another up. Encourage one another. God lays somebody in your heart. Write them a card. Give them a phone call. God will bless you for it. As we do unto others, that's the way we do unto the Lord. That's the way God judges our love for him. That's the way we, that's the way we show it. I pray the service will be a blessing today. We pray for the lost. Pray that people will be online. Pray that we have visitors, even online. As we preach, we're going to trust that the word of God will not return void. Father, bless now our Sunday school hour. Bless our preaching. Father, be with each aspect. Be with Brother Shope as he uh, labors and works to put our service together for us. And then, Lord, uh, we'll thank you for what you'll do. Be with us even this evening in the preaching of your word. And we'll give you the praise and honor in Christ's name. Amen.